Welcome back to Barrio Tales. Today's video will be about how an attempt to get rid of a dropout went south multiple times. Waco, California is located in Kern County. Among the gains in Kern County includes Vario Waco Reefa. Here's where it all started in chronological order and timeline of events. Tony lived in a house in Waco with his mother, Melissa, his mother's boyfriend, 43 year old Ismael Ramirez, his brothers, Javier, Joey, and Tommy, and his sisters, Amanda and Samantha. Tony's father, Raul, and his cousin, Augustine, introduced him to the Vario Waco Rifa gang. Tony was around 15 or 16 years old when he was jumped into the Vario Waco Rifa and began actively participating in gang activity. Tony was familiar with several other VWR gang members and was familiar with the gang's common signs, symbols, color, rivals, and his criminal activities. Just after midnight on July 27, 2011, Tony was hanging out on the front porch of the house with Amanda, her boyfriend Oscar Araujo, and two other men, all of whom were VWR gang members. At some point, deputies drove by and shined their vehicle spotlight on the individuals, which caused Oscar to take off running inside the house in order to hide a 25 caliber Beretta semi-automatic handgun and a 25 caliber ammunition magazine that was loaded with four live rounds inside a washing machine. Subsequently, officers spoke with Tony who stated he had not observed Oscar with the handgun but had observed him with a stun gun, which deputies later found in a laundry basket outside the back door. Oscar was then arrested for possession of the firearm and ammunition. The other VWR gang members became aware that Tony had snitched to law enforcement. As a result of his cooperation with law enforcement, Tony knew he was in bad standing with the VWR, so he wanted to leave. Tony began removing his gang tattoos and he talked with his father, Raul, about how to be jumped out of the gang. Raul told Tony to contact Carlos. Carlos told Tony to meet him at a gang member's backyard. On October 13, 2012, Tony went to the gang member's backyard where three individuals physically beat him for 13 seconds. After the beatings, they told Tony they would let everybody know he was okay and that nobody would mess with them no more. However, later that same night, approximately 10 VWR gang members attacked Tony and his brother, Javier, in an alleyway as they walked to a party. During the attack, these individuals yelled, Vario Waco Rifas, and told Tony they were going to kill him. The gang members repeatedly struck Tony in the head, which caused him to lose consciousness, suffer a fractured jaw, and injuries to both of his eyes. Initially, Tony refused to identify his attackers to law enforcement, but eventually cooperated and identified the attackers as VWR gang members. Deputies located several VWR gang members with bloody clothing near where Tony had been attacked. Thereafter, in August and September 2013, Tony testified in a jury trial against three of his attackers. During Tony's testimony, an active VWR gang member entered the courtroom and stared him down while he was testifying. Tony was intimidated as a result of this act. VWR gang members repeatedly harassed Tony due to his cooperation with law enforcement and in prosecuting the individuals involved in the October 13, 2012 attack. For example, in April 2013, three to four VWR gang members approached Tony and told him he better not go to court. Subsequently, on May 26, 2013, Tony was driving a car in Waco when two VWR gang members drove up next to him and asked, is that Tony? And someone eventually responded, it is him. The VWR members then tried to pull Tony out of his vehicle while saying, Vario Waco Rifas, kill him. Tony drove off, but the VWR members followed him and fired five to six gunshots at his car. Tony attempted to evade the gunshots, which caused him to hit a parked car. Deputies arrived on scene and found one spent shell casing in the alley just east of his residence and six additional spent shell casings on the grass just in front of his residence. Tony told deputies that one of the VWR members told him, if you testify and put my brother or cousin in prison for life, I'll kill you. On August 7, 2013, a VWR gang member went to Tony's house and called him a fucking Leva and stated, Vario Waco Rifas, and then fired 
five to six gunshots at Tony. On January 27, 2014, an individual spray painted Vario Waisco Rifas 187 and Fuck Tony on Tony Chevrolet Silverado in house. A couple weeks later, a VWR gang member went to Tony's house and told Tony, I have a green light to kill you. He also told Tony if he saw him in the streets, he would put a bullet in him. The VWR gang member left Tony's house and yelled, Vario Waisco Rifas. On December 29, 2015, Tony and his family were at his house celebrating his mother Melissa's birthday. Prior to arriving at the house, Tony observed a vehicle following him. Tony parked his vehicle in an alleyway and walked to the house's front porch. The vehicle following Tony stopped. Vario Waisco Rifa gang members Vicente Ibarra and Freddy Santa Cruz exited the vehicle. Both had handguns and fired six shots before getting back into the vehicle and fleeing the scene. Tony got back into his Chevrolet Silverado and followed the vehicle. He observed the vehicle drive into a housing complex and proceeded to call law enforcement to report the shooting. Deputies arrived on scene and Tony described to them the suspect's vehicle but told the deputy he knew who shot him but he refused to tell the deputy who they were. However, Tony later identified both Vicente Ibarra and the third suspect, Omar Arajo, as the shooters. At the scene of the shooting, deputies observed bullet holes in Tony's house and they photographed and seized seven spent 9mm FC Luger shell casings in the street along the curb west of Tony's house. There were also bullet holes observed on the neighbor's house. Two days later, on December 31st, 2015, the family was having a barbecue on the house's front porch. At some point, Ismael Ramirez left the house in his pickup and went to the grocery store. Thereafter, Melissa also left the house and went for a drive. Melissa then came back to the house. Melissa and her son, Javier, then heard gunshots toward the back of the house. Javier grabbed Melissa and threw her on the ground to protect her from the gunfire. After the gunfire stopped, Javier and Melissa ran toward the alley on the east side of the house and observed an older model four-door white Pontiac with a loud engine driving off toward Highway 43. Both Melissa and Javier observed Ibarra in the front passenger seat. Javier also identified Omar Arajo and Alex Gomez as the backseat passengers. Neither Javier nor Melissa saw the vehicle's occupants with any weapons or guns, but Javier did observe them using their hands to display a W, a sign for Vario Escarifa as they drove away. Tony was not at the house during the shooting. Melissa then went outside, walked around the front of the house, and observed Ismael Ramirez lying on the sidewalk with his arms on his chest. Ramirez was alive and was making sounds, but his eyes were rolling back and forth. Melissa kept telling Ramirez, Mike, please get up, get up. Javier then called 911 and Tony returned home a short time later. Subsequently, deputies arrived on scene and observed Ramirez lying on the sidewalk next to his pickup truck with multiple gunshot wounds. Deputies located three shotgun shells and six 9mm bullet casings approximately two to three feet away from Ramirez's body. Ramirez was transported via ambulance to the Kern County Medical Center, where he later died three days later from his injuries. Crime scene technicians seized and booked the six 9mm casings, which all had a head stamp of FC 9mm Luger and three shotgun shells, which all had a head stamped of Hy-Vee Shot 12 from a 12-gauge shotgun. A technician also observed and photographed bullet holes in the back of Ramirez's truck. Ismael Ramirez died from multiple gunshot wounds. On January 1, 2016, a deputy responded to a residence on Birch Street in Waisco regarding a potential shooting. A witness had reported she heard something at night which she believed were fireworks. The next morning, she discovered bullet holes on her house. The deputy observed bullet holes on the witness's house and bullet holes on her vehicle which was parked in front of the witness's house. The deputy searched the surrounding area and found three spent FC 9mm Luger casings, two live FC 9mm Luger rounds, one unspent live shotgun round, and three 12 gauge shotgun shells. The live shotgun round was a Hevi steel brand shotgun shell, as were two of the three spent shells. The other spent shotgun shell was a 12 gauge Winchester. The deputy also located a 9mm bullet fragment. All of these items were seized and booked into evidence. 
between the period of December 2015 and January 1st, 2016. Denise worked at a convenience store in Waco. Denise said she sold two boxes of 12 gauge Hevi steel ammunition to Vicente Ibarra in December 2015. Thereafter, on January 21st, 2016, Ibarra was arrested outside his apartment in Waco. Deputies located a loaded Smith & Wesson 9mm semi-automatic pistol in Ibarra's left pocket and booked the firearm into evidence. Deputies also searched Ibarra's apartment and found a baseball cap, a bandana, and a cell phone. A criminalist performed comparisons of Ibarra's firearm and the seized casings that had been recovered from three shooting scenes. The criminalist believed Ibarra's Smith & Wesson firearm fired all the spent 9mm shell casings recovered from three shootings. Additionally, the criminalist believed the same shotgun fired all the spent shotgun shells recovered from the murder and January 1st, 2016 shooting scenes. Law enforcement never located a shotgun. Two days before New Year's Day, Tony attempted to contact Vicente Ibarra, Omar Harajo, and another Vario Waisco Rifa gang member, Alex Gomez, via Facebook Messenger, using his own Facebook account. Tony was angry at the three men for committing a drive-by shooting at a house where children were present. Specifically, he told Ibarra, I see you, that's what's up. You're going against its rules. Tony also told them he would not tell the police, but also said he would remember this incident. Neither Ibarra nor Araujo replied, but Gomez replied with a thumbs up emoji. In February 2016, in order to obtain information, Tony created a Facebook account using another alias so as to communicate with Gabby Acosta, a VWR gang member. Tony recorded several audio conversations with Acosta, and these conversations were admitted to evidence. Specifically, Acosta unknowingly told Tony that VWR gang members drove a homie's car over to his, Tony's house to kill him, but they failed. She also told Tony that she wanted to finish the job because Tony was the biggest PC in Waco. Another Vario Waco Rifa dropout was arrested around the time of Ismael Ramirez's murder. This particular dropout offered to provide information to police in exchange for leniency. This dropout, Dropout 2, said that they received a phone call on January 8th from his homie, Freddy Santa Cruz, saying that they needed to give Shente Ibarra a ride. Shente Ibarra was also Vicente Ibarra. During the drive, Dropout 2 observed Ibarra armed with a 9mm Smith & Wesson handgun and a sawed-off pump-style shotgun. Dropout 2 described Ibarra as having the keys to Waco, meaning he was high up in the VWR. On the day of the murder, Dropout 2 was drinking with the group of VWR gang members at Araujo's house when they concoded a mission to drive over to Tony's house in the homie's car and kill Tony. Dropout 2 also told police they would provide information on the whereabouts of Ibarra, Araujo, and Gomez. As a result, Police agreed to release the dropout two from custody and place him on ankle monitor on the condition he assists law enforcement in locating Ibarra, Araujo, and Gomez. However, dropout two cut off his ankle monitor as soon as he was released from custody. Thereafter, dropout two was arrested again in late February 2016. Dropout two reached out again to law enforcement to obtain leniency. Dropout two told police that Ibarra had told him. He shot at the Bird Street house after shooting Ramirez on December 31st, 2015. He also told police he observed Santa Cruz with a shotgun on December 31st, 2015, and that Santa Cruz had been checked for failing to kill Tony. Based on this information, detectives in March 2016 arranged to have Dropout 2 and Santa Cruz placed in the same jail cell with the recording device. Portions of the recorded conversations were admitted at trial. During these conversations, Santa Cruz made several admissions. Specifically, Santa Cruz admitted he had been drinking beer with other VWR gang members when they decided to take the homie's car to kill Tony. Santa Cruz confirmed Ismael Ramirez was not the intended target. Santa Cruz also told Dropout 2 that he and Ibarra exited the vehicle and shot at the Bird Street address. Ibarra shot at the house with the 9mm handgun, whereas Santa Cruz shot the house with a shotgun. Santa Cruz also told Dropout 2 about how they cleaned out the homie's car after the shootings. 
On December 16th, 2015, law enforcement intercepted a phone call between Ibarra and a VWR gang member who was incarcerated at the Kern County Jail. Ibarra and the VWR gang member discussed how some of the younger VWR members have been hanging out with the PCs in Waco and thus should be punished. The VWR gang member told Ibarra, and when I get out homie, best believe I'm going to be handling business full, fuck them PCs homie. And Ibarra replied, we out here, we're already on that. Those fools, they're going to have a rude awakening, but until then. On January 24, 2016, law enforcement recorded a phone conversation between Ibarra, who was incarcerated at Kern County Jail, and his sister Jackie. Ibarra called Jackie because he needed money to be added to his account in jail. On three separate occasions, Jackie asked Ibarra for an explanation as to his involvement in the shootings. Jackie asked Ibarra, why brother? And then asked him, I mean why brother? Fuck. Ibarra did not answer either question. Finally, Jackie asked Ibarra, my question is why? And Ibarra replied, yeah I'm not going to answer that. Jackie then stated, I know you, whatever you, I know that you're not going to answer, you're not gonna, but it's like come on. The prosecutor asked police, why was that call significant to them? And the police replied, I felt the fact he didn't, he didn't say that he didn't do it, that he wasn't involved, was significant to me. When fighting the case in jail, Vicente Ibarra assaulted Dropout 2, who was giving police all the information. Vicente Ibarra and Freddy Santa Cruz were caught Omar Araujo went on the run to Mexico, but was later caught and brought back to Kern County. Vario Waisco Rifa gang member Omar Araujo was acquitted of all charges and found not guilty. Let me repeat that, not guilty. Vario Waisco Rifa gang members Vicente Ibarra and Freddy Santa Cruz were found guilty with the first degree murder of Ismael Ramirez, conspiracy to commit murder, Attempted first degree murder, two counts of unlawfully discharging a firearm at an inhabited dwelling, and gun charges. In the summer of 2022, both Vicente Ibarra and Freddy Santa Cruz were sentenced to life in prison without parole.